picture this. You walk into your local grocery store, not only armed with a plan that's going to save you money, but will also make meal prep a breeze. Well, that's exactly what you're about to get in this month's pantry chat. Darling, by the time we're done, you're gonna be amazed at how much you can save without sacrificing on quality. I'm gonna tell you what to buy and why. Then, back in the kitchen, I'll show you some incredible mouth-watering recipes designed to make the most of your budget-friendly haul. From cozy fall soups, easy freezer breakfast to hearty one-pot wonders, I've got you covered. And the best part is that I'll reveal time-saving tricks that will streamline your meal prep process, leaving you with plenty of time to enjoy these beautiful fall evenings. All right, let's get to it. As usual, we're gonna start with this month's grocery guide. It's a list of the produce that's in season, which will be at its lowest cost all year, and will taste the most fresh. It's also your cue to think about your preservation plan. Are you gonna can it, freeze it, ferment it, dehydrate it, whatever, so that you have enough to last when you can no longer source it inexpensively, or grow it from your garden. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and read straight from my October Grocery Guide, which if you've already signed up, is sitting right in your inbox waiting for you to print or reference on your phone when you're at the grocery store. Honey, I know you're pulled in many different directions, so I'm happy to share my cheat sheets with you. This guide sorts out your seasonal fruits and veggies, provides a brief description about how to select the best produce, and then includes a section for you to circle your preservation plan. Sign up now using the link below in the description box to get next month's grocery guide delivered straight to your inbox. All right, so the October vegetables that you wanna meal prep around this month include artichoke, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, celery, cabbage, cauliflower, chicory, leeks, parsnips, peas, turnips, squash, peppers, and sweet potatoes. And I'm gonna show you my preservation recipe for six of those vegetables in a minute, okay? And the seasonal fruits that you wanna stick with this month are apples, blackberries, raspberries, plums, pears, pomegranates, grapes, figs, cranberries, nectarines, grapefruit, kiwi, and kints. Now, since you're already gonna be stocking up on broccoli this month, let me show you a delicious way to sneak this healthy vegetable into a breakfast, yes, I said breakfast recipe, that your family will be asking for second and third helpings of. Broccoli biscuits are a hearty hybrid of a drop biscuit and fluffy omelet that easily adapts to what you have on hand. After heating a pan with a bit of oil, toss in chopped onion and your choice of pork, chicken, or turkey sausage. I'm using ground turkey from a clearance Thanksgiving bird that I caught on sale earlier this spring. While the meat and onions are melting together and browning, take your broccoli, which if you opt for organic, generally includes the stem, which is edible and delicious in other recipes. Broccoli has a very low pesticide risk, but often conventional broccoli doesn't come with the stems. Toss the florets in a pan and cook until things are well done. This biscuit batch is for my dad, so I'm using almond flour, which is keto and gluten-free, but you can also use all-purpose flour. Grab a bowl and combine the flour, baking powder, chili flakes, and truly your favorite seasonings. In a separate bowl, whisk together a few eggs and sprinkle in some cheese, then pour your wet ingredients into your flour mix and stir to combine. Take a baking sheet and line it with parchment paper or a silicone baking mat because now it's time to stir in our stovetop mix. If you're using almond flour, you'll notice the dough is a bit loose and that's okay. It'll firm up when you bake it. Use a measuring cup to scoop out your biscuits. Sprinkle the tops of your biscuits with a bit more cheese, then place your baking sheet in the oven for about 15 minutes. What comes out is a high protein, veggie filled, and nutrient dense meal to fuel your morning or truly any time of the day. If you haven't made friends with Brussels sprouts yet, let me tell you this. These tiny green buddies come ready to party with like a whole spectrum of flavor that's compatible to almost anything you want. If you haven't tried the combination of balsamic maple glaze on, well, anything, get on it. The only way to describe it is a sweet and tangy tango in your mouth. You may think I'm exaggerating, but not by much. The sweetness of the maple syrup with the deep complex flavor of the balsamic and that tang combine together to create this explosion of flavor that pairs well with any meat and especially your roasted vegetables, but I say in particular your Brussels sprouts. Last year when I was catching up on candy with Rachel from that 1870s homestead, my mouth hit the floor when I saw her canning her Brussels sprouts in a balsamic maple glaze. I thought, what a genius idea. I will link her channel and recipe, which is exactly what I followed, but let me show you how they turned out. 
All right, y'all, so let's go ahead and do this taste test. It has been exactly, well, a little bit, 10, 15 of last year is when I canned these balsamic uh, Brussels sprouts, but here's what the jar looks like. The liquid still looks delicious. I still see, you know, the red chili pepper flakes that are in there, and these Brussels sprouts from the farmer's market were huge last year. All right, so I still see that the can has a really good seal, so I'm gonna go ahead and pop that open. Ooh, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and smell. Oh my goodness, mm. it smells really good. I don't know if you can kind of see that. Where's my fork? Here it is. All right, and then the way that I wanna prepare these, I'm gonna go ahead and just eat one straight out of the jar, but I would love to still kind of like saute these up in this broth. Okay, these are still really firm. Like it took me a while to kind of like, can you see that? To kind of like, ooh, you know, like push my, um, fork in the Brussels sprout. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Wow. I only chewed with my mouth open so you can kind of hear it, but I think you can actually see just how like crunchy these are. These would saute up like no problem. There is, it's a subtle kind of vinegary taste, not overpowering. That's not my preference. There's a nice like gentle little spice from the red chili flakes. The right amount of sweet. Like you could still make this, um, this vinegar broth like lean any direction, but this is, this is really good. Oh, I love this, right? Oh my goodness. This recipe is on repeat for this year. And here's another seasonal dish that combines the goodness of Brussels sprouts with broccoli and dried cranberries. It's a sheet pan meal that's excellent as a side dish or topped with chicken, turkey, or diced potatoes makes it a main dish. I'm removing the stems from my broccoli because I want to use them to make veggie stock, but you slice up the broccoli and then spread the florets across the pan. Next, slice your Brussels in half so that they'll cook faster, and then season your veggies with, you know, a bit of salt, pepper, and then massage them with a bit of olive oil so that the seasoning sticks. Place your pan in a 450 degrees oven for about 20 minutes. While your Brussels and broccoli are baking, take a medium heat pepper, slice it along with an equal amount of shallot. Heat a pan with olive oil and add crushed coriander seeds, red wine vinegar, a few bay leaves, honey, and sweetened dried cranberries, which are on sale this time of year. Over medium heat, stir until you have a slightly syrupy consistency and your craisins have plumped. Cut the heat and remove the bay leaves. Grab your roasted veggies from the oven and transfer to a serving platter. Top with your cranberry mixture and stir to coat that sweet tangy glazed mixture throughout. This is great as is, but get creative and add your choice of nuts or feta cheese crumbles. Brussels sprouts are loaded with minerals like manganese, folate, and omega-3 fatty acids. This recipe makes getting those nutrients a pleasure. Now in a bit, I'm gonna show you a recipe for potatoes. No, I didn't misspeak, I said potatoes. That's right, it's a low carb satisfying substitute for creamy mashed potatoes that's made with the goodness of turnips and cauliflower. So stand by for that recipe just a little bit later in the video. You're likely used to seeing white cauliflower, but your farmer's market is likely to offer orange or sometimes known as cheddar cauliflower, which has a sweeter and milder flavor compared to white cauliflower. Some people describe it as having a subtle fruity undertone. This sweetness is due to its higher level of beta keratin. Fermenting cauliflower not only gives it a deeper and more robust taste compared to raw or cooked cauliflower, but provides beneficial bacteria that helps balance your gut microbiome. As we enter cold and flu season, I really lean on increasing our fermented food intake as a way to naturally strengthen my immune system. All you need is a simple salt brine and you can store fermented cauliflower for three to four months, even longer. This recipe is too simple not to make.
Now this time of year, you're about to see beautiful heads of cabbage appear at your local farmer's market. You can easily stock up on this vegetable and make your own sauerkraut. And let me tell you, if you think you don't like sauerkraut, but you've only ever had the stuff at the store like I did, let me tell you, homemade sauerkraut is in a league of its own. The thing is, most of the sauerkraut you buy in the store has been pasteurized or heated to a certain temperature to have a long shelf life. The heat causes the kraut to lose its texture and flavor and kills any probiotic value. It ends up being sterile and stinky, but homemade has flavor, crunch, and an aroma that doesn't punch you in the face. A safe all-purpose fermentation salt brine ratio is typically about 2-3% to salt by weight when making fermented vegetables. This means that the salt to water ratio for a vegetable ferment brine solution is typically around 2-3 to tablespoons of salt per quart or 4 cups of water. A few tools like a stainless steel stomper, glass weights, and airlock lids makes the process foolproof. Jarring your own fruits always wins out on quality and flavor over store-bought. Here's how easy it is to bottle up the flavor of fresh pears and turn it into a shelf-stable treat that you'll enjoy all year long. I agree with the age-old tip that Bartlett's shown here are best for canning. They're firm enough to hold up to cooking and tender up nicely without turning into mush. Bosque pears, shown here, can yield mixed results, but are perfect for pear sauces and butters. These are Dianju pears, and if you decide to use these, make sure they start off firm or slightly underripe. If they're already ripe when you go to cook them, they're more likely to turn mushy. Once you've got your pears back home, be sure to wash the skins because you can save them to make pear skin sugar to sweeten up your baked goods or sprinkle in hotter iced tea. That's why as I peel the skins, I place my dehydrator racks underneath to catch the skins. I also squirt a bit of lemon juice into a bowl of water to keep my pears from browning too much. I'm spreading my skins out across the racks to ensure sufficient airflow, and I'll pop them into my dehydrator I store in the basement. You can can pear halves or slices like I am. Pears are one of my dad's favorite fruits and he's in town, so I couldn't be too upset when this happened. Dad, seriously? Oh my gosh! That's not a beer my mom. Oh. <laughs> Who can relate? Pears can be canned in a variety of liquids, including water, but this time I opted to use low sugar apple juice since I've got plenty of it stocked away. I'm going to add a few cinnamon sticks and nutmeg to give it that classic flavor. This is a water bath recipe, meaning you just need a large stock pot filled with boiling water, which you'll use to immerse your jars. Because fruit is a high acid food, a water bath is sufficient to create a vacuum seal and effectively preserve the contents for long-term storage and shelf stability. Goodness, doesn't this look delish? If you want the best canning lids on the market, stick with the Four Jars brand. It's quality you can feel, and I love that the canning lids come with sufficient labeling space and a pre-marked date grid. You can use my code FARMGIRL10 to take 10% off your order at fourjars.co. Oh, I'm saving and freezing my pear cores to make pear jelly, but I'll be doing that project next weekend. If this is our first time meeting, hi, I'm Cassandra from the blog, becomingafarmgirl.com. I'm here to help you start canning and create a home preserve pantry your family will love. In addition to that, I show you how to become a farm girl before the farm in a small space and in your spare time. So if you're on a similar path and want someone to journey alongside you, let's do this together. Links to recipes and some of the items that you see me using are in the description box below. October is also the perfect time to start stocking up on your winter squash. Now you do know that they'll keep for a minimum of three, but usually up to six months if you just stock them in a place that has a little bit of airflow. Now I know what you're thinking, Cassandra, I don't have room to store all these squash, and honestly, Neither do I. That's exactly why I had to get a little creative with my storage solutions. On the other side of my townhouse kitchen is a combined dining and family room, which is where a bench with a shoe rack is. This time of year, I find another place for our board games and shoes and repurpose the racks as a place to store squash we'll eat over the coming months. It's visible in a cool, dark place, and who says you can only store things in your kitchen? So feel free to get creative with your storage solutions too. My favorite squash includes spaghetti, acorn, butternut, and delicata. The skins of acorn, butternut, and delicata are completely edible. At least once a week from here on out, I love knowing that all I have to do is grab one or several squash, split it open, and bake it for an easy meal that works with any sauce, meat, or veggies I have on hand. Y'all, just like that, it's carrot and fennel soup season. And to think it was just a recipe that I dabbled with a couple of years ago, and now it's become one of my dad's favorite soups. I mean, you only need five ingredients, so it's quick, but truly the magic of this recipe is taking fresh seasonal carrots and that sweet taste that they have, combined with the savory, unique flavor that is fennel. Oh, perfection. If you have a roaster, crock pot, or large stock pot, this recipe is pretty low prep. Here's the fennel. It comes with the stalks and leaves, which are edible and perfect for seasoning broth, 
and the fennel ball, which is the part we'll use for this recipe. You'll slice a few, toss them into your pan or roaster, and drizzle with olive oil to brown and soften. While that's happening, peel your carrots, which is an optional step, but doing so helps to bring out their sweeter taste than unpeeled carrots' earthier flavor. Save those peels to make a nourishing vegetable broth, and then chop the carrots and toss them into your roaster and add either vegetable or beef broth. Let things simmer over medium heat until your veggies are completely softened. At the end, you're going to season with white pepper and salt and use an immersion blender to blend the soup. This recipe can be canned, and I've got an entire video dedicated to making and canning carrot soup, which I'll link. That video also includes several meal ideas showing you the unexpected ways that you're going to enjoy this soup. All right, let's talk about it because you're probably wondering, Cassandra, where have you been? <sighs> Honestly, overwhelmed but in the best way possible. So several months ago, I was asked to be a speaker at the Homesteaders of America conference, which is held every year in Front Royal, Virginia. When Amy Fuel, the founder, reached out to me and was someone that I had already been following for a number of years through her herbalism work, I was almost certain that she had the wrong account. I mean, I was really in disbelief and thought that it was initially an imposter account. But no, I had really been given the invitation and since I had planned on going to HOA anyways, I said yes. I am not a full-time content creator, y'all, not even close. I work full-time as a school administrator year-round. And so during the summer, I had started to like roughly outline what I was going to talk about. But then towards the end of September, as things were starting to get closer, my, <laughs> my nerves really started to get the best of me um, as the weekend of October 13th got closer. Plus, I have never spoken at a conference before, so there were things that I just wasn't as familiar with, like trying to get together a tent display and some of the other kind of nuts and bolts. And so quite honestly, I just had to reallocate my filming time to working on my two presentations. Plus, I still wanted to maintain my home responsibilities, and I kept up with my farm chores at Crystal's. Because guess what? One day when I have my farm animals, they're not going to care whether it's a conference weekend or not. So it was important to me that even while my schedule was packing out, that I was committed to the chores that are going to be a part of my daily lifestyle as a homesteader. And more recently, we've had bigger chores, like changing the quail tent from the darker cover to limit heat and sun exposure during the summer to a lighter color for the fall and winter months. Whether it's repairing electric fencing, cleaning out the chicken coop, or something else, I'm so appreciative that my friend Crystal includes me in the day-to-day -day operations and wide-ranging experience you'll come across as a bird keeper. This is a self-designed cover that she's used for several seasons, which lets in more light. This helps the quail maintain their egg production because quail need about 14 hours of light per day to trigger the hormones needed to produce eggs. The weekend before HOA, my husband, a Navy chief, had an out-of-town assignment, which he had to leave for at 2 a.m. Saturday morning. I'm up making sure that he has his coffee and a bit of breakfast to take with him, but I was a bit bummed that his work would take him away for a week. But hey, I'm also very used to this and longer periods of time than a week, and he called every day to encourage me. So the next time you see me, I already would have given my first presentation at HOA. That's crazy. <laughs> I'll be up there Saturday. Mm. Mm, I love you. I love you too, sweetie. Mm. Love you. Okay. See you Saturday. See you Saturday, sweetie. So first, my folks drove up from Florida, and I am so glad because, as some of y'all know, oh, about two weeks ago, our truck went kaput, and so I was so thankful that my dad drove up in Big Blue. Now y'all know every truck has a name, and his is Big Blue. Oh, you guys are making really good time. Yeah, we are. Okay, well, yeah, I would say push on through. Okay, all right. Okay. Push on. Yeah, even if, I'm, even if I'm asleep, you know, just let yourself in. All right, I'll see you guys soon. It's almost 11 o'clock, and Thor and I are trying to stay awake because my parents should be here any minute. You're still eating good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, so I've got to insert a little background info so that what you're about to see makes sense. Now, while I know that the Lord will bless us with the farm in his timing, I am truly so appreciative of this townhouse because here in this little cul-de-sac, I've got some really good neighbors. So with our neighbors to the right, her daughter actually walks my dog Thor during the work week. And then with my two other townhouse neighbors, we're like in a cluster of four, we frequently have dinner and bonfires with them. And then with the other neighbors and the cul-de-sac, I mean, I know these folks and their pets and, you know, we frequently are just out, you know, chatting and that kind of thing. And, you know, you don't find that everywhere. We keep an eye on each other. We share what we have. And, you know, that's, I value that. So my neighbor, Monica, two doors down, started a photography business a couple of years ago. And she took these beautiful photos of my green stalks. Yeah, it was her photography that was featured in the green stalk magazine. Monica, yes. I have an important announcement to make. There's a gardener in this magazine that you may know. <laughs> so here's your magazine. And, <laughs> and oh my god, and your credit, your name's in the back too, Monica. Is it? it is. No, yes, wait. Monica Murphy. Okay, so we have to open this. Let me oh, see. And here's the one that's okay, already open. You ready? You ready? Who took that? Me. Oh, no, you? me. <laughs> <laughs> All it of like the credits. So, I know. You made me look so, so good. And the ah, garden looks so great. It yeah. Looks so good. Monica, her husband Kevin, and their two boys are absolutely delightful, and we are genuine friends. But even more than that, I am certain that I'm rubbing off on her. And what I mean by that is that Monica's starting to become a farm girl too. Now she's at the beginning of her journey, but I see all the signs that she's about to fully embrace farm life in her future. Monica, if you're watching, it's true girl. For example, she expressed interest in coming with me to dispatch chicken and quails, but with two littles, it didn't work out. So when Crystal told me that she had a few birds she wanted to offer, Load, I reached out to Monica to tell her that I would have a few birds at my house if she was still interested in learning how to butcher. Have you decided? We're gonna do it. Yes! Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna guide you through the process. I'm a pro now. So, all right, we'll see you in about oh, like 45 minutes. Of course. I'm like, okay, I cannot hesitate. Just. That's the thing. Exactly. See, you already know what to do. Those scissors are really sharp. They're really sharp. So then, Dad and I headed over to Crystal's place to pick up the birds. They're getting so big. So what are you doing now? So I put a bit in his nose. That way they can't kill each other. Because they'll um, bite, like, they'll scalp each other. Oh, peck mm -hmm. eyes. And then they'll grab the back of their neck and shake and like lacerate their neck. Okay. Here's one. That's ready, Dad. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what's yeah. they like. Try that one. Oh, I, I got the stem. Yeah, I got some tray. You don't need the stem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so good, right? Yep. I know. Yep. <laughs> Here. And I'm just going to do like this. All right. Now with the quail in a crate on the front porch, it would be my first time walking someone through the process. Now I am going to show clips of neck dislocation and parts of evisceration, not to be gruesome, but as a valuable teaching opportunity. My hope is that it can show others that are interested in learning how to harvest their own meat, how non-intimidating the process can be. You look fantastic. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. I know. I've never seen any of my pictures printed out this big. It's, I mean, wow, the quality, whatever you did, it is stunning. Well, now we know so what to stunning. do. So stunning, exactly. We, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I've never done that before. And it's not too ironic that I am holding a quail that we're about to eat as oh, we're marveling buddy. over. I don't want to get connected to you, but you're very sweet. <laughs> 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 I know I can watch. I don't know if I can do it. I'll try. Absolutely. That Beginning is the first step. So. Oh, it looks so good. Yeah. They wow, came out really, they really nice. Wow, job. You did this at Staples? I did. If I could live on a farm with animals and all kinds of... <laughs> and just all of us live together mm. and never... <laughs> no, that won't Let's happen. Let's do it, Monica. Let me. No, but you can kill everything and I'll be in the fields frolicking dinner, with the hounds. Dinner time and, 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 the, and the chickens. I'll be like, oh, chickens mm. for dinner. Did How, How did this happen? <laughs> So I need to, here. before you do it, yeah. okay, where, where are you So cutting? I'm getting as, like, okay, right here. Okay, so you already right did a couple. The neck. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, so it's right. literally, okay. It's going to okay. be here. Right. 
And then I'm just gonna commit. All yeah, right, okay. okay. And I have to keep my eyes open. Commit. Okay. okay, so literally right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, two, okay, three. You got it? Yeah. Boom, oh, there you go, you did it. It was two cuts. See how like your instinct Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over? Okay, okay. Yep, and now these are just the reflexes. Well, you did it, girl! Okay. Congrats! I can't believe I just did that. As long as I don't, I'm not looking the poor guy in the eyes, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. I won't let go until you're like, I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's fluttering. Yeah. They're very jumpy, very skittish birds. Okay, got it. Yeah. And then maybe try to like orientate it where his head is a little bit. Oh, oh his head comes down. Are you recording yeah. this? I am. You, you do notice what she's doing. What? She's acting like she's calling a baby. <laughs> oh my god! You're right! Oh god! You really what are! You doing? Yeah, I'm like, Monica! Turn it this way! You're, you're dying! Like, oh, I'm no, no nothing! You're going, oh, you're going to a happier no. place! <laughs> yes! I, I can do it. I'm you're sorry. Gonna, you're gonna have yeah, I'll hold it still. Okay. I'm sorry. And you did it! No, I was doing it though. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, it's already done. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Good job. That was a bad one. Sorry. Look at that. Hey, that hind leg of yours, you know? Hey. Are you holding it too, Dad? Yeah. Okay. Hey. Hey. Look at him. He just did like, it was like nothing. Dad is a farm boy. <laughs> is that what you got your farm girlness? Pretty much. Uh. We've been neighbors for six years, and laughs aside, that's how not intimidating the process can be when you have a friend to reassure you and guide you through the process. I'm really proud of Monica. She's taken the first step towards an empowering skill where she sees herself as someone that can not only raise, but also harvest her own meat. I'm also glad that we went at a pace that she was comfortable with, me holding the bird while she cut. Which is a very important thing because you do not have to go from A to Z all at once. Maybe next time she'll hold the bird and then after that get comfortable with removing the feathers and the entrails, but she's well on her way. My first time dispatching birds with Crystal, we used a game bird plucker, but I wanted to try a manual method that I saw on YouTube that doesn't require any tools or heating water in a scalding pot. Quail skin is quite thin and delicate, so if you apply a little pressure, it comes off, well, like a jacket is how I would describe it. I got better and faster at this method with the rest of the birds, but I really like this approach. After that, I got to be the teacher again and showed my dad how to remove the entrails. Since these birds are small, we use the spatchcock or butterfly technique, which involves removing the backbone so that it can be cooked more evenly. This reduces cook time and results in crispy skin and tender meat. That's like a fish. All right, so after that, it was time to get ready for HOA. Packing my bags is where things started to feel surreal. I was a ball of emotion. While I was ready to attend what is truly my favorite conference, I also couldn't quite calm my nerves. It's a good thing that I had lots of prep work that kept my mind distracted. We loaded up dad's truck, hopped on the beltway, and arrived a few hours later at an Airbnb that I had booked many months ago, a few miles outside of Front Royal. It was a single-story ranch-style house with a beautifully landscaped backyard that featured a fire pit, outdoor seating areas, a fenced-in garden with a gravel walkway, cozy seating, and a bit of elbow room from the nearest neighbor. Here's what my dad had to say. Maybe we was country before we knew what country was because this just feels right. Exactly. Exactly, Dad. Yeah. This just feels like, yeah. You know, whatever, 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 this, this feels right. It does. I loved the floor plan of this house and it would be a dream to have something like this one day. You walk in immediately to the dining room and the kitchen was functional and open with a small mud room in the back. And then behind it was a spacious family room and lots of encouraging notes sprinkled throughout the remaining three bedrooms. Thank you. 
I packed some freezer meals, which was a comfort and cost savings because eating out when you're away from home is not only expensive, it's often reduced quality. After setting the table, we enjoyed broccoli, rice, and cheese, some mixed veggies, and seasoned chicken thighs. And for that long call, we praise and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Dad and mom unwinded the rest of the evening with a bonfire and I tucked in my room to practice my presentation. All right, you guys, it is the day of the conference, the morning of the conference. It's 4.25 a.m. Um, I just, I can't sleep. So I'm going through my presentation slides, um, which are really fun. I hope everything just loads. I emailed them earlier in the week with my presentation and I have a hard drive. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I would totally be lying if I said I didn't have the jitters, but I'm hoping that it's more so like the excited, excitable jitters. Um, and I'm just gonna be myself. <laughs> That's all I can be, right? Um, I don't know, I'm just translating yourself from video and in your home to a live audience is just it's a, it's a new experience for me but I definitely want to meet the other farm girls in person um, so that'd be awesome all right wish me luck I barely slept a wink Thursday night so after making a few final notes I just got dressed and headed to the kitchen to make breakfast for mom and dad There are sessions every 60 to 90 minutes and I was first up at 8 a.m. This is about 10 minutes before my session started. Now, prior to this event, several friendly faces approached me and made me feel right at ease. Cassandra, it's actually the first time that I have met her, but get more uh, we're closely tied to agriculture. In fact, that really shows us that we're just one or two generations removed from a more agrarian life. To all of these, not at once, but again over time, really puts you at an advantage uh, in your kitchen. So dehydrating is also super easy. I have a dehydrator that I thrifted the Nesco brand. It was five dollars. I got good feedback from my sessions, and you know, once I got started and recognized some faces in the crowd, it felt like I was just talking to old friends and the butterflies went away. And you know, I was myself, and it felt like, I don't like, kind of like this. Now, I actually don't have a lot of footage from the event because after my presentations on both days, I went to my Meet the Speaker tent, and I am telling you, I was in nonstop consecutive conversations with folks that were just so life-giving. Every person I met felt like a, I finally found you friend, and we jumped into conversations immediately. As I was walking around the conference, friends would call out my name, and that felt so good because until Crystal here more recently, and of course my family, I've really been craving that in-person connection to you know others that are also along their homestead journey. And let me tell you, I had to travel all the way to HOA. I mean, it's not far, it's in Virginia. But I had to travel there just to find other farm girls and gents that are also in my very same city and state that are also along similar journeys. And that's the power of attending these conferences. It helps you find your tribe. You'll likely start to see some of the new friends here in my area that I connected with. And then there were several other Maryland homesteaders that invited me to do farm chores on their property. Y'all, I just, ugh. Oh, 
What an amazing time. Like I cannot wait to start my farm chores because it's going to front load my learning and add that much more color to the homestead that I envision having one day. To everyone that came up to me, that prayed with me, I cannot tell you what an honor it was to meet you. Now I'm a hugger, so everyone got snuggles for me, but I cannot tell you how much my parents and my husband enjoyed your company. All right, so once we got home, the fun didn't stop because remember, we had to fix our quail dinner. All right, here's the meal bin I prepped before we left. It has the marinated quail meat and a few turnips and a head of cauliflower, which we're going to use to make the potatoes I mentioned earlier. You've got to try this recipe, which really isn't one because it's a great way to subtly add variety to your diet and to eat seasonally without stretching yourself thin trying a new recipe. You make them just like you would regular mashed potatoes. So start by bringing everything to a boil. I pulled some cream cheese from the freezer because I wanted to make a cheesecake to show off the lemon blueberry pie filling I showed you how to can this summer during June's pantry chat. A basic cheesecake recipe isn't fussy, and really it's a wonder that I don't make them more often. Since the topping is sweet, I opted to reduce the sugar that a normal recipe calls for. Now this past summer, I caught pecan nut pie crust on clearance. And since my dad loves nuts, I grabbed a few with this recipe in mind. Pouring the cheesecake into the pie crust and letting things chill in the fridge for a few hours was the hardest part. Okay, let's return to the potatoes. After you drain the water, Fold in some cream cheese and sour cream along with a pat of butter, and then you're going to sprinkle in your seasons to taste. I like to use an immersion blender to blend everything together and give it that creamy texture. Now it was time to make the quail. Taking these marinated birds out of the bag filled me with pride because this is food that is sourced locally and sustainably, not because I bought it, but because it represented the truest connection to my food since I played a part in raising it. And just a few months ago, I would have never imagined I'd be able to show and share with my parents and neighbors a meal with folks that I care about that also had a hand in its preparation. Y'all, this tiny little moment is the good life. All right, Dad. First, just just presentation alone. What are your thoughts? Looks good. It oh, looks really ahead. good. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, open at it. Go ahead and hold it. Taste as good as it looks. First, go ahead and here's your napkin underneath. I got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. First, go ahead and taste the mash. <sighs> With your fork, not the knife. Whatever. <laughs> good flavor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Turnips mm. and cauliflower. So low carb. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm trying to do you halfway right with your okay. keto stuff. Yeah, I can, I can eat these. I can eat these. Yeah. I can eat this. This is good. Okay. All right. <laughs> I do like mashed potatoes, but hey. Exactly. When you're diabetic and stuff, you got to watch them keto. You got to watch those carbs. So this here, low carb, good keto, this works. Okay. Mm. All right. So now let's go ahead and initial impressions of this is the first time you've ever had quail, right? Yeah. <laughs> let me see here. That's it. Let me sit this down. That's true. Okay. We've sat things down. Okay. Here we go. Ah, the food of kings. Hmm. It's gamier than chicken. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. duck, but less fatty. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
I think I'm able to destroy uh, what we got a ten of these. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I'll be able to. I, I can destroy three or four of these in a sitting. Okay. All right. Mm. All, right All right. Let's go ahead and take it to the table. <laughs> How's that for a bone? Let's see here. How's that? Oh yeah, that's looking good. You think that'll make the ants mad? Oh my gosh. Mm. <laughs> I later went back and made a pan dripping quail gravy, which was delicious. Needless to say, my dad's plate came back full of clean bones, which shows that his first taste of quail won't be his last. These blueberries have been sitting on my shelf for almost four months, and they are just as plump as the day I got them from the market. That's the power of preservation. You can eat well both in and out of seasons when you strategically stock throughout the year. Now my favorite pie is lemon. My favorite <laughs> cake icing is lemon. So let's see if we're gonna do this some justice. Definitely taste these blueberries off in there and eat this, this topping because I tell you what, I'm going to have to throw this on some biscuits too. <laughs> yeah. It's not over the top sweet but that lemon zest. No, the, really tang no, the tanginess yeah. that is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's not like traditional blueberry um, toppings on your cheesecake and stuff. Exactly. Now, this is good. This is good. You know me. I like nothing more than when I put food in my mouth. I like an explosion. Yes. Of, of, of flavors and textures. And when I bite into something, I want one thing to hit me when I first bite into it. And something else later on and stuff. And that does it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dad. This is good. Yeah, this is good. Oh, big news, y'all. So some of y'all know that my parents moved to Florida when I was an undergrad, but I stayed here in Maryland. My husband and I love living in this region, and so ideally, I would want to have my parents either join us on our property or at least live close by. I mean, that would be a dream come true, which is why this next part is so exciting. All right, where are we getting ready to go? Cockyville, look at a house. Move back to Maryland. Oh! <laughs> yeah, mom and dad are in the initial stages of coming back up north. There's no hard timeline, but they will be working with a realtor and scoping out different areas. I will absolutely keep you posted. Now, I don't really watch TV because I usually just enjoy my homesteading or how-to channels on YouTube as I'm cooking or cleaning. But if the TV is on, it's tuned to MPT or Maryland Public Television, which is one of the free channels that you get over the airways. And I genuinely enjoy almost everything they feature because it's a mix of kitchen, garden, history, and health type content. Well, about several years ago, this beautiful, uh, maybe one hour program called the Great Scenic Railroad Journey really drew me in. That program, and I've caught it several times since then, does a beautiful job of touring you through our preserved train lines and delving into the history of our nation's railroads. One of the landmarks that they mentioned was the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, and I just knew that I wanted to have a genuine train ride experience. Since mom and dad were already up and the fall seasonal colors will provide a striking background, we all embarked on our first train ride. to haul coal out of Maryland and West Virginia, the Western Maryland Railway was one of the great railroads of the Appalachian Mountains. Today, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad has revived its mountain spirit, and one can now experience the scenic Allegheny Mountains from inside of a comfortable streamlined air passenger car. 
the year-round steam or diesel trains depart from Cumberland and travel to the mountain town of Frostburg. As your train climbs along the mountainside, you will pass through cuts, over streams through a 914-foot tunnel, and be treated to some of the best vistas Mountain Maryland has to offer. So we've stopped for some reason, and we're not sure why. Yeah, maybe I have to get out and push. <laughs> Someone said maybe there's a train robbery. But we found this little area that has like, I'm going to call it cutouts. That is not the word. But this is great. Oh, Dad. It is just so gorgeous. Look, yeah. I mean, look at these colors. I know, I'm just going to try to get a picture. Dad, you got the shot. Yeah, that's oh, totally that's good. Oh, that's great. That's really good. Yeah. To get more recipe inspiration or catch up on the previous pantry chat, click on the video on your screen. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care, friends.